Hello everyone, this is Dr. Bob Ramiti, and I am here to talk today about the Reflexes Lab in Biology 244. Uh, this lab is being set up in such a way that you should be able to conduct at least a good amount of the lab in your home with one other person there to help you. Uh, you can see from the picture here, uh, we're going to need a few tools. Um, we do recommend that you have a reflex hammer but since this is something that not everybody has hanging around the house, I will show you how to make a reflex hammer out of two pencils, a couple of rubber bands, and a big pencil eraser. You will also need a light source of some sort. So I've got a picture of a pen light here up at the top, uh, but you can just as easily use a flashlight or the light from your cell phone, and you will need a ruler, preferably one that has measurements in millimeters. So what is a reflex? A reflex is a fast, automatic, predictable response to a stimulus. Now it's important for you to know that there are five parts of a reflex arc. And if you're paying attention, this should sound an awful lot like something that many classes talk about in the beginning of the semester when you're talking about homeostasis and the three parts of a feedback system. Those are incorporated into the parts of a reflex arc. So that might be a little helpful. First part of a reflex is the receptor. So this is the specific part of the sensory neuron that's able to detect some sort of environmental change. Part two is going to be a sensory neuron. So this is the rest of the neuron that will be carrying the action potential that was generated in the receptor along the rest of the cell on the way to the central nervous system. Integration center is part three. This is going to be located in the central nervous system, so either in the brain or the spinal cord. The motor neuron, which is going to synapse with the neurons in the integration center and be carrying the action potentials for how the brain or the spinal cord wants to respond to the stimulus to the effector and the effector is the last part of the reflex this is the thing that's actually going to make the change uh, instructed by the integration center so this picture right here is an example of both a monosynaptic and a polysynaptic reflex arc as the name implies a monosynaptic reflex arc has only one synapse a polysynaptic reflex arc is going to have two or more synapses here. So if we look at the forearm over here, okay, we see step number one is the receptor. So in the extensor digitorum muscle here, there are actually uh, sense receptors that are able to detect when the muscle stretches too much. This is an evolutionary advantage because it provides a system to prevent the muscle from stretching too much and possibly being damaged. So the receptor is able to detect that there's a lot of stretch and it's going to generate an action potential that's then going to travel up the rest of the sensory neuron. And in fact, if we look at the dorsal root of the spinal cord here, we see this ganglion, this swollen area right here, which is going to contain the cell body. That's the cell body of our neuron. As it enters, this is the cross section through a spinal cord that should be familiar with you by now. So the sensory neuron is then going to go into the spinal cord, which is part of our central nervous system. And here, something interesting takes place. This sensory neuron is going to synapse with two other neurons here. So in our monosynaptic reflex arc, the sensory neuron is going to synapse with the motor neuron here. This is representing our synapse. The motor neuron is then going to go out of the spinal cord through the ventral or anterior root of the spinal cord, making its way to progressively smaller and smaller and smaller nerves until it reaches um, the effector, which in this case is the extensor digitorum muscle. So the motor neuron synapses with the extensor digitorum muscle, our effector, causing that muscle to contract. By contracting, it's going to prevent the muscle from overstretching. Now, in addition, this is kind of cool, the sensory neuron is also going to synapse with an interneuron. The interneuron is going to decide that, hey, we're having some stretch in the extensor digitorum muscle here. So in order to allow the extensor digitorum muscle to contract, 
we need to relax the antagonistic muscle, the muscle that would oppose the action of the extensor digitorum. So the interneuron then is going to synapse with a different motor neuron, indicated in purple here, and this motor neuron is going to go to whatever the antagonistic muscle for the extensor digitorum is, causing it to relax. So that when the extensor digitorum relax or contracts, it's able to contract and tighten up and thus protecting the muscle. So the purpose of this lab is to take what we've learned about the nervous system, plus don't tell anybody, um, we're also trying to bring up some stuff that we've learned in some earlier labs, like the skeletal system lab, the muscles lab, and the articulations lab, and uh, get you to understand a little bit about the parts of a neurological exam, but also to get some extra practice with these labs that we've used in the past, because hopefully by now you know that the lab final for this class is going to be comprehensive. It's going to cover everything. Now, in addition, a neurological exam is an important tool to use if you suspect that somebody has some sort of neurological damage because a neurological exam is quick, it's easy, it's relatively inexpensive, um, and problems indicated by a neurological exam could mean then you would want to use more expensive tests like uh, MRI, which can be quite expensive. All right, so the parts of the neurological exam that we're going to talk about include mental status check, checking the cranial nerves, motor systems check, sensory systems check, and testing muscle stretch reflexes. And the extensor digitorum example we used just a few minutes ago is an example of a muscle stretch reflex. So a mental status check is a pretty quick and easy way of seeing if there's a problem with the nervous system and it involves simply talking with the patient and observing their responses. Now there is quite a bit more that goes into a mental status check than what we're sharing here. Here are just a few examples of things that you would want to look at. So in a mental status check you might assess a person's speech. Is the person speaking normally or are they slurring their words and having some difficulty? That can mean a couple of different things. So somebody slurring their speech, it could be something like they have some sort of intoxication, alcohol, or some type of drugs. Uh, conversely, it could mean that the person is experiencing a stroke and needs to have further assessment pretty quickly. Behavioral assessment. Uh, is the person acting within the normal bounds of what you would expect a person to behave? Um, this could be something that might be hard to assess. Let's say somebody is in a traffic accident and they are behaving unusually. You know, this could be a sign that they've had a traumatic experience and are having some difficulty. Or it could also be a sign of some sort of neurological impairment. Another component of the mental status check is to check their cognition or check their thought processes. Uh, one of the things we look for is, is, is the person oriented to person, place, and time? Let's say you come across somebody who's been in an automobile accident. Um, number one, before you do anything, make sure that the scene is safe before you just walk up to somebody. Um, you don't want to get yourself injured in the process of trying to help somebody else but you walk up to the person and you say, hey, how you doing there? What happened? And if the person is able to say, hey, I was in a, a car accident, um, you know, this jerk just cut me off and, and we got in a wreck, you know, after you make sure that the person's safe, you know, ask them some idea of what happened, ask them if they know what day and time it is, ask them if they know who they are. Any difficulties with this might be an indication that the person has had some sort of head trauma, in which case you want to be really careful, perhaps even um, putting a cervical collar or isolating their neck um, and their head just to make sure that there isn't something serious that can go wrong. All right, another test that can be done is by testing the cranial nerves. We've been talking about the cranial nerves in the nervous system lab. 
So you can test cranial nerve number one, the olfactory nerve, by giving somebody something to smell. Um, common things to use would be smelling vanilla, smelling something lemony. Um, they don't recommend that you give foul smelling or bad smelling things um, while testing this nerve. You can test cranial nerve number two, the optic nerve, by using something like the Snellen chart that you see here, giving them the opportunity to read the letters on the different lines to see if the optic nerve is working, function, uh, working properly. Um, we will be doing a pupillary reflex test in a little while, and the pupillary reflex test um, checks cranial nerve number two, the optic nerve, as well as cranial nerve number three, the oculomotor nerve, which will be controlling the size of the pupil, which is the hole in the iris that's going to regulate how much light goes into the retina. We can do motor systems tests. And motor system tests, as the name implies, are going to test motor pathways, or sometimes they're called efferent with an E pathways, that are taking motor commands from the central nervous system to the various effectors. A very common motor system test would be watching somebody walk and making sure that all the movements are appropriate. Um, something else that is done, and we will be doing this in this lab, is the plantar reflex test. So we're going to see that a lot of the reflexes that we are going to be testing evolved to help protect us from damage. It has certainly happened that way with the muscle stretch reflex, and it's going to work in the plantar reflex. So if we were about to step on something pointy and sharp, like say a tack, the plantar reflex evolved to kind of move our foot away from that uh, sharp object and thus protect the foot. Um, in a normal plantar reflex, we would see plantar flexion of the big toe and, and the other toes. An abnormal response, which is called Babinski sign, would involve dorsiflexion of the big toe and fanning of the other toes. And this actually is a sign of problem with the corticospinal tract in the spinal cord. Um, and in this case, it would cause the stimulation of the wrong muscles, which might actually cause more damage to the foot if you were stepping on something sharp. Sensory system tests, test receptors and the interneurons that are going to interpret these stimuli. Uh, very commonly, if somebody has had a spinal cord injury, you might take something kind of sharp like a pin, being careful not to draw blood, but applying painful stimuli to the skin to see if the person can sense where the pain is being applied. Um, another common sensory system test is to have a person close their eyes and draw on the palm of their hand with their eyes closed letters and numbers and see if the person can identify what letters or numbers are being drawn. Muscle stretch receptors. So in these muscle stretch tests, um, again, the receptors evolve to protect us from overstretching those muscles. Good example of this is if you ever seen somebody getting tired and they start to do the head bob where their head is flexing. You know, there's a lot of important stuff going through the neck and the throat. We've got our airway, we've got the spinal cord, we've got lots of spinal nerves, we've got uh, arteries and veins. So flexing the head at the neck too much could interfere with these different anatomical parts. Um, so stretch receptors in the trapezius muscle, hopefully you remember that, uh, in the trapezius muscle will detect overstretching and will result in contraction of the trapezius muscles and having the person put their head back up. The patellar reflex, which we will also be doing in here, evolved to help protect the quadricep femoris muscles. Now, for testing at home, we're going to make a reflex hammer out of two pencils, two rubber bands, and a large pencil eraser. When you're done, it should look something like this. I know it looks a little odd, but I've practiced this, and it does a pretty decent job of allowing us to touch these different, uh, uh, these different receptors. So by striking the tendon, or striking in some cases the muscle, we'll be activating those stretch receptors. Uh, some of the responses are going to be pretty obvious, 
like when we're testing the patellar tendon, if you're doing it right, there will be some extension in the leg. Some of these, like when we do the biceps brachii test, it's not so much that you're going to see the response so much, but you will feel the muscle contract as your hand is palpating the tendon. Now, some of these muscle stretch reflexes can be difficult if the person is anticipating what you're gonna do. If they contract their muscles before you even begin to test them, you're not going to see the results. So you're gonna to need to try to get your patient to relax. One of the things you can do is before you start whacking on them with your field expedient reflex hammer here, uh, you might have them do some math problems. Um, when my children were going through school, they had something called the doubles club. So what is one plus one and two plus two and three plus three and have person keep going up the doubles club as far as they can go. It's not important that they get all the answers right. What is important is that they're thinking about the math. They're not thinking about what uh, you're about to test. Another thing I sometimes do is tell people to go to their happy place. So think about where their favorite vacation spot is and as they're describing in as rich detail as they can what it's like to be sitting on a beach sipping something fruity or hiking through the mountains or whatever it happens to be, they're not thinking about you doing that. A uh, third thing that you can do is what's sometimes called the Gendrasic Maneuver where you can see my daughter here demonstrating, you have the person grab their hands and pull. And as long as they're pulling and really focusing on their upper extremity muscles, you're able to do tests in the lower extremities uh, fairly easily. All right, when you're going to do the muscle stretch reflexes, you wanna have slight tension in the muscle and you do that by applying a little flexion in the joint and I will demonstrate how you do that. And if you're testing the patellar tendon or the Achilles tendon, you wanna make sure that the person does not have their foot on the ground. Uh, the friction that would cause, uh, be caused by moving uh, the limb would make it a little difficult to see uh, movement. When you're doing a test, you're gonna to need to be recording this. If this was a patient, you would be recording it in their chart. So we need to have the ability to grade reflexes. So we use this to determine if the response is normal or abnormal. Somebody has a grade of zero. So you are conducting a test and there's no response. Grade of zero is always considered abnormal. If the person uh, has a slight response, we say this is a grade of plus one. In some people, this could be a normal response. They just have, uh, for some reason, a, a lower, slightly lower than normal response. But for them, it's okay. You know, it, it could be all right. But in some people, this could be a sign of a problem. A grade of plus two is what you call a typical response. This is always considered normal. A grade of plus three is a stronger than normal response. In this case, it could also be normal for this person or a sign of a problem. And a grade of four plus four represents clonus, where you have repeated contractions of the muscle. And this is something that would always be considered abnormal. Now, when you're conducting these tests, you would expect that the responses are symmetrical, meaning that when you test the left side, the right side should also have the similar. So if you're, say, conducting the left patellar tendon test and you get a grade of plus two, uh, you would also expect on the right side to have a grade of plus two. So having different responses on each side could be a sign of a problem. Unusual responses can be a sign of operator error. And let's be realistic, if you've never done these tests before, um, they do take some practice. So, you know, don't be afraid if you're not eliciting the result that you'd expect. Um, it could be a sign of some unrelated injury to the patient. So when I am doing the patellar tendon test, um, I have had students that had a plus one or a zero response. And when I asked them about it, you know, they've had some sort of injury to the knee unrelated to the nervous system that is responsible for this. Or, and this is the reason why we're doing this, it could be a sign of injury or disease. Hey, when you do the test, you should be recording your observations in the lab book.
All right, so in order to conduct the pupillary reflex, we're going to be testing cranial nerves two and three, the optic and oculomotor nerves. Okay, what's happening is as we are increasing the amount of light that's going into the pupil, the pupil is the hole in the iris that you can see right here. Increasing the amount of light going into the pupil will cause the pupil to get smaller. This is because posterior to the pupil is going to be the retina, that layer of cells that is sensitive to light. And if you're increasing the amount of light that's going into the pupil, the pupil doesn't have to be as big. It can get smaller in order to let the same amount of light in to generate action potentials in the retina. Decreasing the amount of light, thus when it's getting dark, is going to cause the pupil to get bigger. Maybe you've experienced this before when it's time for bed and you turn out the light and you're walking to your, uh, the bed. I don't know about you, but I have to maneuver around dogs and Legos and other things that have been deposited in my room. Um, right when I turn the light off, I have to try to memorize the safe path in order to get there, uh, but it's hard to see in the dark. But if I'm laying in bed for 10 or 15 minutes and realize, oh, I forgot to check the front door to make sure it was locked. Uh, when I open my eyes, hey, I can see better in the dark. That's because over that period of time, the pupil has gotten bigger. So it's allowing more light to get into my retina. And as a result, I'm able to see a little better. So to conduct this test, you're going to need a light. Could be a flashlight or could be a cell phone. You're going to need a ruler with millimeter measurements. Okay, when you are conducting this test on your patient or your partner, please do not touch the eye. This will be painful and there's no need for you to touch it. Um, when you hold the ruler up to the pupil, estimate it as close as you can, but you certainly don't want to do any harm. Okay, and we're going to start this by measuring the diameter of the pupil in millimeters and recording this in the lab book. So this is before we do anything else. Okay, after we've measured the size of the pupil, then you want to have the patient cover one or even better yet, both eyes for at least two minutes. Okay, and at the end of two minutes, you're going to have them open their eyes and you're going to use the millimeter ruler to try to measure how big the pupil is. So once the patient opens his or her, his or her eye, measure the diameter of the pupil immediately and if everything is happening right, it should be bigger than it was when we started. After you get these measurements, then you want to shine a light into the person's eye for at least 10 seconds. And then you want to measure the diameter of the pupil again. And if everything is working properly, it should be smaller than the starting diameter. Well, if we're going to do reflex testing, it helps to have a reflex hammer. A reflex hammer is used to tap on a muscle or tap on a tendon in order to elicit a response. But let's be realistic. You probably don't have one of these at your house. Fortunately, we can make one using materials that are probably around your house. So we're going to need two pencils, preferably unsharpened, two erasers, and a large pencil eraser. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to, want to take the pencils and sandwich them in between your pencil eraser, like this. We're then going to put one rubber band on top to secure them. Like so. And the other rubber band is going to go underneath. Voila! Field Expedient Reflex Hammer. So this first reflex we're going to test is actually going to be testing two at about the same time. The first of which is the glabella reflex. So hopefully you remember from the first lab, the glabella represents this area in the frontal bone here in between the eyebrows. Uh, testing the glabella reflex is testing the trigeminal and the facial nerve. 
the jaw jerk reflex is going to be uh, involved touching the tip of the mandible here. Now both of these represent startle reflexes, so you should see a little bit of movement in your patients when you're applying this, but please be gentle. It doesn't take an awful lot in order to elicit a response. Uh, something else to keep in mind, that if your patient is a little nervous or thinking about something else, you can try the gendrastic maneuver or have them start thinking about doing some math or something to get their mind off of this. So I'm going to encourage you to have your patient close their eyes, have them think about their happy place or some math, and then don't tell them what you're going to do. Um, if you've told them about the glabella and the jaw jerk, uh, even better yet, just tell them to close your eyes and relax. And you're going to want to just touch the glabella real gently. You might have to tap on the mandible a little bit more. But uh, go ahead and do these tests and see what type of a response you elicit. The next tendon we're going to be testing is the biceps tendon. Now, the biceps test is going to be testing uh, cervical vertebra uh, C5 and C6, or the, the spinal nerves that come out of C5 and C6. Um, and in order to find the biceps brachii, and just to note, we usually call it the biceps test, but of course you know the muscle is the biceps brachii. Um, in order to find the tendon, what I'm going to ask you to do is to take the subject that you're working with, I want you to grasp their hand, and I want you to ask them to try to flex their arm at the elbow. And as you do that, I want you to provide some resistance. And when you do, the biceps tendon should stand out. It'll be this nice cord-like structure right here. Okay, please contract against my hand. Holy smokes! All right, relax. Okay, so I've got my, should I need to put my thumb over the tendon here. You're then gonna take your reflex hammer and you're gonna strike your thumb. By striking your thumb, it's gonna push down on the tendon, uh, activating the stretch receptors there and starting the biceps brachii to contract. Okay, it may help if you have a little bit of bend in your arm, that's going to you know, put a little bit of tension on it, and we're going to strike it like that. Felt it much better that time. It's really slight. You're not always going to see the biceps brachii move, but you should feel your thumb being pushed back a little bit. And that's the biceps test. For this next test, we're going to be testing the triceps brachii and the triceps tendon. As hopefully you remember, the biceps brachii is on the anterior part of the arm and that's going to cause flexion of the arm at the elbow. The triceps brachii is on the posterior side of the arm and that's going to allow for extension of the arm at the elbow. Like with the biceps brachii, the best way to find the tendon is to contract the muscle. So I'm going to ask my model here to face this way. I'm going to, go ahead and relax, I'm going to uh, uh, support the arm a little bit and I'm going to ask him to push against my hand. So when he pushes against my hand, the triceps tendon should stand out and I'm going to palpate that with my thumb. So go ahead and push against my hand please. Oh, there we go, that's a good one. Okay, relax. And here I'm going to be tapping again my thumb with the hammer. Oh, I felt it that time. And that's the triceps test. So for this next test, we are going to be testing the brachioradialis muscle. Hopefully you remember the brachioradialis is going to be on the lateral aspect of the forearm. And to find the brachioradialis, find the radius here. You know it's going to be close to the radius. And you're going to want to contract the brachioradialis muscle. So I'm going to hold the subject's hand here and I'm going to ask him to flex his wrist or flex his hand at the wrist. So go ahead and flex that for me. Oh yeah. And you'll see these nice cord-like tendons sticking out. You can do it by tapping your thumb but honestly you'll get better results if you use the reflex hammer here and actually tap on the tendon. And that's the brachioradialis test. So the next reflex we're going to test is the patellar ligament. To find the pal uh, patellar ligament, you're going to palpate the patella, go immediately distal to that, and you should find the tibial tuberosity. The patellar ligament is going to be just in between them, and you should be able to palpate it, and it is a little squishy. Okay? Finding this area right here, you're going to be striking it with 
the wide edge of your uh, reflex hammer or the end of your eraser. Now it's important that your subject's feet is off the floor. So if they're on the floor, friction is gonna prevent them from extending their foot. It's also important that they are not thinking about what you're doing because if they tense up their quad muscles in the first place, they're also gonna tense up their hamstrings and you're not gonna get a good result. So finding the area right here, you're gonna give it a good solid strike. Okay, for the next reflex, we're gonna be testing the calcaneal tendon. Now hopefully you remember that the calcaneal tendon attaches to the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscles. So by tapping on the calcaneal tendon, it's going to initiate a reflex that should cause these muscles to contract. Do you remember what the action of the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscles is? Well, hopefully you remember it should be plantar flexion. So for this test, we're going to dorsiflect the foot a little bit. You want to have a little bit of tension in the tendon here. Okay, just relax. Hey, make sure your subject is not thinking too much about what you're going to be doing. And then you're gonna take the reflex hammer and you're gonna tap right on the Achilles tendon. You can't miss it, it's this huge tendon right here. Okay, and I'm gonna provide, just make sure that he's dorsiflexed a little bit, put a little tension in here, and there you go, calcaneal tendon test. The next test that we're going to be doing is the plantar reflex. And as we mentioned before, the plantar reflex is going to be testing this reflex that evolved to help protect the foot from stepping on something sharp. So for this test, you're gonna need your patient to have their shoes and socks off, and you're gonna to need to have kind of a hard edge. It might be the blunt end of a pen, it might be a popsicle stick, and you're gonna take this and you're gonna run it along the lateral aspect of the foot, and about at the tarso-metatarsal joint, you're gonna be moving it medially across to the big toe. Now, you will have to apply some pressure. Um, if you're conducting the test and there's no response, you're gonna to have to push a little harder if needed. Um, if the person is ticklish, you're gonna to have to push even harder still to overcome that tickle reflex. Okay, move medially across the tarsal metatarsal joint. So this is about where the tarsal bones meet up with the metatarsals, the foot bones. In a normal response for the plantar reflex, you're gonna have plantar flexion of the toes. In an abnormal response, or what's called Babinski sign, we're gonna have dorsiflexion of the great toe and fanning of the other toes. And again, this indicates damage to the corticospinal tract of the spinal cord at around the S1 or the first sacral spinal nerve level. Now, as we mentioned in the video before, the plantar reflex is going to be uh, a response to stepping on some sort of a painful stimulus, a nail or a rock or something. So you're gonna to need to take something sharp. It could be uh, the tip of a pen, and you don't use the ink side, or a popsicle stick or something along those lines and you're gonna to wanna to move the end up the lateral side of the foot, and then at about the tarso-metatarsal joint, you're gonna move medially across. So the question always comes up, how hard should you press? Probably the best thing to do is start out with medium pressure and then working up harder if need be. Uh, in particular, if the person is ticklish, you might need to push a little harder to overcome the tickle reflex. So in a normal response, what we would expect to see is plantar flexion here. So let's see what we get. Oh, look at that big toe! Perfect response. This is exactly what we're looking for in the plantar reflex. So while you're working on this lab, a few things to keep in mind. As you're conducting each one of these tests, please be sure to record your results in the table at the end of the lab. Please remember that part of the reason why we're doing this lab is to help reinforce things that we've talked about earlier in the semester. So when we use terms like flexion and extension and the names of muscles and the names of nerves, please make sure that you are reviewing those. Uh, make sure you work on the lab review questions at the end of the lab. Uh, and all of this is important because the information from this lab will be fair game for lab test number three as well as the lab final. So thank you for your time. 
keep up the hard work and we'll see you around.